thank you for the opportunity. You might note there's something missing on this map. And what I'm going to do is basically um, look at what we've learned in 300 years and the contrast this is a metaphor for <clears throat> what we have learned in the last 300 years as illustrated by a point cloud of a tree that Mike Olson gave me years ago and I use often for this purpose. So what I'm going to do is not uh, convey a lot of polished results or anything uh, super um, cutting edge, but instead try to sample a broad range of problems and field areas where high resolution topography is front and center of how we're going about science and try to um, elicit some and motivate some questions and opportunities and challenges and needs as we go. So this is work with current students and postdocs and others. And just to highlight why I'm going to drag you uh, deep into the woods, quite literally, is that um, a lot of the uh, um, intellectual heritage of many of us goes back to James Dwight Dana. And he was there by accident. Uh, and his ship crashed off the coast of Oregon near Astoria, spent a lot of time uh, hanging out, and eventually decided to go overland down to San Francisco instead of on a boat. And along the way, he made a lot of amazing observations. There's a great paper by Jim O'Connor about uh, Dana and fluvialism in the, in the Pacific Northwest. But one thing he did say is that this place is bristling with trees and little of seeming interest because he just simply couldn't see the landscape. So now we have lasers see through the landscape. So what I want to do then is tell you a little bit about what these uh, point clouds, more generally speaking, have been able to tell us about the critical zone, about how hill slopes work, about fire, uh, and about a little bit of paleoseismology. So it's a lot I'm going to touch on various things and along the way kind of list the opportunities, challenges, and needs. The first is the critical zone. This is something that's gained a lot of momentum in our field that brings together hydrology, uh, the weathering community, the geomorphic community, the geochemistry community, community and um, what can we say about the critical zone based purely on topography alone? It would be fantastic if we could develop a means to predict how deep we have to go down to get to fresh rock, to get to soil, to get to saprolite, all the characteristic elements of the critical zone based on topography alone. Well, there are, the reason I bring this up is that there are a suite of hypotheses for what controls how thick and how deep you need to get to get down to the critical zone. They are based on things like topographic stress and tectonic background stresses, um, which are also dependent on the topographic configuration. They are dependent on the water table. Uh, and the incision rate of channels, which is highly coupled and feedback, feedback with topography. It is based on hypotheses about the weathering front and subsurface flow and uh, hydrologic uh, processes and how those move solutes around and accomplish weathering along the way, as well as climate, uh, the per uh, pervasiveness of frost weathering processes, whether one side of a hill is more prone to that than others. So there's these really broad, disparate ideas about the critical zone. And they all have topography as a really important control variable. So I'm just going to show you a couple. This should look familiar. Um, in, in a world where we have a steady eroding landscape, where rock is coming up and erosion is taking away, you might expect that that critical zone is relatively stable. If it's slowly eroding, it might be quite deep. Um, in, in other words, if there's an imbalance between erosion and weathering, the weathering front might propagate much faster than the erosion to move that material. And so erosion rate could be a simple first order proxy for um, the critical zone, not just how deep it is, but how well developed it is. So this is a patch of topography. And you should see a pattern. This is slope on the left. Red is deep, blue is gentle. There's forest rows imposed. This is a ridge line here and valley in the direction. And this is the Laplacian, uh, the total curvature here, or the curvature relative to Z. Here, uh, and so you see sharp ridges in red and valley bottoms in blue. And this divide here separates two sides, of which you see much sharper hills on the right side and much more broadly convex hill slopes on the left side. And in fact, if we go out and sample the soils and look at the uh, critical zone, we see highly depleted, highly weathered, deep critical zone um, profiles on the left side and very, very fresh rock near the surface. with um, really narrow critical zone on the right side. So topography is a first order indicator of some simple uh, critical zone processes that we can go out and measure and diagnose and connect the geochemistry with what the surface of the Earth is telling us. Um, on the right side, you see 
the canopy. As I mentioned earlier, you have to go into the trees. And uh, living amongst those trees, uh, and I thought this was an artifact at first, but you'll see these hill slopes, which are soil mantled completely, have a series of stripes across them. This is not an artifact or something like that. These are lithologically controlled steps. And Sam, who is here, has worked on this for part of his dissertation in these sort of shadow uh, bedding controlled uh, morphology, whereby the bedrock gets really close to the surface, the soil is thin, thick, and thin. And so, trade offs between the transport and the thickness of the soil give you, even though it's a soil mantle landscape, stripes. So, we can learn something about soil production processes purely from topography here. These stripes on the landscape are telling us about the lithologic control through the canopy um, underneath soil. So we're learning about this interface right there purely from the uh, point clouds that we've been generated uh, or that have been given to us from the, the, the LiDAR data. So those are just a couple uh, hint suggestions. Um, more broadly, these ideas about the critical zone have um, inspired lots of subsurface geophysical work, hydrologic work, as I was mentioning, to try to understand the trade off between these things. So the points I wanted to emphasize, though, is that I think our community can improve our ability to provide topographic context and process models to inform where um, people put instruments, where they do their sampling, to try to understand these critical zone processes. There's questions about uh, defining features. Do you need to smooth topography? Do you need to enhance edges? There's all these different choices you make if you want to make these pretty maps. Often, if you don't do smoothing, you don't get um, slope maps as, as, as um, uh, uh, coherent as the ones I just showed you. So there's choices. And a lot of those choices should connect to the processes and ideas. Um, finally, there's patterns um, that we probably don't have models to explain. So the ability of mining these new tools that we heard hints about through here uh, today and, and yesterday, machine learning and other things that allow us to start to collect these like features and try to go out and look for them is something I think that holds a lot of promise as well. Uh, the next I want to highlight is a different kind of um, collection of pol uh, laser pulses, uh, work of Danica Roth and David Furbish. This is a hill slope right here. And we tend to think of how soil or something moves on a hill slope based on the local conditions, that you would look at how steep you are, look at how curved you are, or some other property, and think about the flux rates that result. David Furbish's world begins um, with something very different, and the idea that you mobilize sediment, trans uh, sediment I should say, on a hill slope, but then, where most of our effort should be is focused on what causes it to slow down and stop. That's what he calls disentrainment. And so, by looking at the mobilization rate and then the probability of that mobilized material continuing to be transported down a hill slope, you can uh, integrate those. And this is a convolution where you have to look everywhere up slope of you to figure out the flux at a particular point in the landscape. You can quantify the sediment flux using that uh, formulation. So Danica got interested in this idea and applying it to real landscape and wondering about what happens if a tree falls over, if a burrow happens, what is going to happen to these particles? Well, it depends on the slope, the roughness of the surface, how big the grains are. So she's gone out and dropped particles on real hill slopes to try to pull apart these effects on how particles move down a hill slope. And what she's used to achieve the roughness in the hill slope is this TLS. Uh, and it's been an ongoing saga, and so this is just a highlight of what Danica has done, and please see her poster um, to see some of the details, but that is key floating from UNASCO coming out with PLS, and there's a lot of, of uh, vegetables out there, as Kevin Schmidt would like to say, that require some filtering. There's things, this, these things called mixed pixels or deviations, or the uh, sort of uh, wrapping around things. These are actually ferns, so these are the individual fronds or the leaves of stored ferns that you can see in the background in that picture in the upper right, which Danica has uh, been working on processing, taking out. And the, the idea is to come up with a functional roughness map. What is the surface and the vegetation um, that affects sediment transport? So you want to take out some of the vegetation, but maybe not all of it, the part that affects how far particles um, travel, you want to keep in. So there's a lot of choices, a lot of interaction with the point cloud that Danica is undergoing to try to connect the real topography that she's measured with the sediment transport plot. So having the ability to jump in and move through the classification process in a systematic way is an important curve. Now, the reason why it's important in the Pacific Northwest and other parts of the US is that when you burn the landscape, you change both of those things in the Furbishian world. 
you mobilize a lot of material over a short amount of time, and you smooth the landscape surface, and you accomplish incredibly rapid sediment transport. And that's what we're experiencing all over the western U.S. right now. So Danica has done the same exercise in some post-burn areas. In this case, she used uh, structure for motion on drones. And we put my hill slope class to get us uh, to work dropping the particles. Um, that roughness parameter, you can measure in any number of ways. This is a table that just came out in the paper. Um, and there's everything from power spectra to eigenvalues to standard deviation of a surf of points relative to a plane. There's all kinds of ways to measure roughness, and it really depends on what you want. This paper by Smith and Warburton is motivated by the idea of trying to understand how peatlands erode. Uh, and this is in northern England. And you can use these topographic characteristics to look at how these peatlands are going away, whether it's water, defecation, wind, all these different processes lead to the destabilization of peatlands. And they've been exploring how the rust distinguishers can reflect that. Um, contrast that with something out of the uh, fault mechanics literature. Emily Brodsky has looked at the details of fault zones, exhumed fault zones as well as ones in the laboratory, and used power spectral density to look at the roughness characteristics. Um, and there's amazing ability to what she's been able to do is back out the strength of the fault based on the, the waviness and the asperities and how what they strength they need to prevent or give way to fault rupture. So roughness um, is this great amorphous thing that we all kind of think about, but maybe not confront in a systematic fashion as we could. So that was one of the things I wanted to emphasize here is that there's a process reason for thinking about understanding for quantifying roughness in all these different ways that I think um, people working in rivers, on hill slopes, on salt, whatever it is, can take advantage of. But then there's the more fundamental thing that uh, Craig and others have told us about is just it's important for error. If you're going to do change detection, the roughness of that surface matters tremendously. So we have a lot of tools that have not been systematically addressed for uh, uh, thinking about roughness writ large. Uh, and finally, the top two items are things we've talked about more generally um, throughout this time together, our time together. So the, the, one of the last things I want to mention is something that's happening right now. You cannot find a place in the western U.S. right now that is smoke-free, it seems like, the more I look at the maps. This is the scene just over a year, or, uh, just under a year ago, in the Columbia River Gorge. That's in the background would be Multnomah Falls, if you've ever driven through the gorge. Um, on your way to Portland, it was on fire. Uh, last September for virtually a whole month. And so the question of how all these fire-prone landscapes are going to respond is a major endeavor that I think our community's tools can really help address. This is what it looked like soon after. The thing to note, and as Craig and Darren and others at NCOM are intimately familiar with, is a lot of vertical release. This is Columbia River flood basalts, a couple of kilometers stacked up of these um, basaltic rocks that give rise to cliffs and beautiful things like waterfalls that are interspersed with more gently sloping surfaces that are mantles of trees. So just from the uh, bird's eye perspective from, from flights as well as field visits, the fire induced an incredible amount of sediment transfer. So the incineration of all that vegetation led to destabilization of talus, soil, rockfall, all kinds of things started moving. Uh, this is sort of the sort of typical view of some of these big stream talus flows along the interstate, the Department of Transportation, the Bureau of, of uh, or sorry, the Army Corps of Engineers has been highly concerned. All the trails, the Pacific Crest Trail has been closed for a great deal of time because of this as well. So meters and meters of stuff piling up around the landscape due to destabilization. So we got the idea that we could try to do um, some LIDAR work. And I wanted to give a huge caveat that I have been working uh, with LIDAR since 1994. Well, five, we were just mentioning earlier, and I have done this and everyone else has done this. So I'm saying this as a, a bit of a dinosaur in the world is that this is the first change detection that I've worked on. And so I've been fortunate to have a student postdoc doing all the hard work. I'm just up here telling these stories. What Brooke has started to do, she's just arrived um, a couple months ago in the lab. She's been pulling together data from 2005 onward from different sources, Army Corps, um, the Oregon LIDAR Consortium and others, and we were able to pull together money from NSF and other agencies, and thanks to some heroic efforts by uh, Craig for making this happen and using that modular LIDAR that he mentioned earlier, putting it on a helicopter in the um, Portland area and flying this a few months ago that we have some post-fire 
um, data. I have no results. We got the data yesterday. Thank you again, Greg. I will um, buy you a beer later. Uh, but this is a, a glimpse of what it looks like. And so we will soon be um, interrogating this. Um, uh, uh, Brooke will soon be interrogating this to try to better understand. And again, I think the one thing that people may not appreciate is the intimate connection with biology. Trees, ferns, all that stuff is front and center of what's causing this place to respond in such a dramatic fashion. Um, early efforts at looking at change detection from the 2009 and the 2010 data sets, just to sort of practice, see what's possible, suggest that we're um, getting relatively reasonable uh, error, um, even on steep slopes, 30 to 41 degrees, underneath uh, 40 to 50 meters of canopy, Douglas fir, which is pretty dense stuff, but we're still getting at least under a meter uh, and averaging you know, 20 to 30 centimeters in some of these areas. Once you get to some of these steps, the errors pop up. So there's classification, there's interpolation errors, and we're absolutely going to have to move to the, the point cloud-based mode of thinking. Um, Craig mentioned this to me last night, and I had this slide already in the talk. But this is also what makes this landscape a fabulous geomorphic laboratory, but a bane to people trying to trim the clouds is these things like overhangs, where there's trees growing underneath here. Uh, and so this really requires us to think about not just airborne lasers, but uh, terrestrial drones. And my colleague, Lee Karlstrom, is, is already going after some drone-based surveys of this area as well. And more generally, though, the steep areas of the western US are going to need change detection, and they are steep. And so getting a better sense of the error and understanding where we can and can't detect change is absolutely essential to um, understanding what's happening in the western US. Me looking at these talus-based uh, erosional events has um, suggested to me that there's a, um, an opportunity to try to track sediment more uh, coherently across the landscape. So change detection algorithms that actually try to accommodate and integrate the, the path. So using flow algorithms to take material that's moving somewhere and, and transport it down slope and compare what we see with change relative to these flow paths um, is uh, an area of promise as well. And there's a nice paper that sort of started to get at this one that just came out earlier this year as well. We can start to, to think about continuity, sediment transport itself, not just something going up or down, uh, but um, the actual transport. And the final thing, um, I'll just make a plug for the paleo seismology colleagues that I hang out with, is that LIDAR has done more than just find faults in the forest, uh, which it has been tremendously successful of. This is an example of our efforts that just came out in EOS last two weeks ago, of how LIDAR has really changed the game and our ability to think about Cascadia earthquakes. And we're able to map landslides in the forest that have made little lakes and we've been going out and generating dendrochronology um, uh, analyses to determine if those tree rings match up with the last 1700 events that we know rock um, Cascadia. So LIDAR, this would not be possible without LIDAR. We are finding needles in the haystack and then doing very detailed localized work trying to connect them to actual geologic events in our past. I'll leave it at that. classification, I guess, is, and is, is a big part of it. So you mean just like more than lab tools or more than like different methods or just uh, easier to use software or I, I, online? Well, maybe those, those tools exist more so than we've, we've been um, uh, extracting as of yet. So I, I'll plead some amount of ignorance, but also um, uh, raise it as a as a continued discussion for sort of early time users, especially when we're dealing with point clouds as, as, as in their fundamental form. Um, understanding where those classifications come from is is something I think we can um, learn more from, learn more about, or I would like to learn more about. That could be a, a one of my own limitations rather than a community limitation. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah. Thought a lot about this. Do you think that I noticed you switched to TLS for doing that? Do you think that the security you get TLS gets about this about some kind of the slide artist can't quite get into the machine? It also brings the time. Danik is here. Um, I think that's one of the reasons we haven't really been explored yet. We haven't really seen whether we need a centimeter scale or a centimeter or a meter or, or what the cost benefit is in the different scales. So that's what I think is a very interesting thing to get. That's one of the things that I'm sorry about. But I think I have more information on that. And this is only going to get more annoying if we go to doing this point where they do have some capacity. So I was wondering if you have any opinions on what is the length scale over which we should measure these metrics and how we can go about doing this. Well, that's something we wrestle with a lot. And when I was a grad student, I made decisions based on what made pretty maps. And um, since then, we've tried to come up with some more systematic means to do that. But it is, I think it's completely application dependent. But I'm not sure that we still have a set of metrics, analyses, protocols for ideas for how to find that characteristic length scale. I mean, we did come up with one suggestion for what you know is an appropriate scaling length in the forest based on hits and mounds, things like that. But and in a channel bed, you know, things like gravel bed forms, things like that. It just it's so problem dependent that um, it, it merits the the level of of rigor in terms of asking the question, but I, I think it's something that each researcher needs to sort of confront. But again, um, having the tools available for them to ask how to answer the question, I think is something we don't have a very good handle on. Uh, Jeff, you're talking about the Yeah, I, I, Toby, I don't have, it's a good question. I don't have much to say apart from maybe we just need to change our perspective. No yeah. pun intended, but literally, I think the, um, the stratigraphy of the, the basalt flows is a big part of the story here. So these overhangs occur because of feedback between the properties of the, the rocks and weathering and hydraulics and things like that. So it'd be great to be able to measure those in those environments. Um, but yeah, it just takes effort, right? It's just it's a lot of, of, of time and um, defining them relative to a surface, um, yeah, would require some some thinking. Um, that, but we haven't we haven't confronted it yet. We're just thankful that we have some data to start uh, thinking about. 